733. Um, I'm Heather Von Mering. I'm chair of the planning board. Today, um, the planning board has a, a very interesting agenda. Um, we are starting, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some updates of some things that are going on um, and update the full board on things that we've been working on. From there, we will be going into 654 Main Street presentation and public comment will be welcome after the, um, the team uh, does a short presentation. Thereafter, at 820, we are going to discuss the master plan. Uh, the planning board has received a handful of comments from residents and also are going to be taking comments from the audience and feedback, and then the planning board will be discussing a handful of those um, with each other. Thereafter, we'll do uh, 9 o'clock new business that was not known at time of the posting. 9.10, we'll go into executive session, and hopefully we'll adjourn before 10 p.m. Um, just so everyone knows, if you speak, you are being recorded by WinCam. Um, and moving forward, um, we today we received meeting minutes regarding Converse Place from the um, the team, the design team. And um, I think in our next agenda, I will bring these in and we can review them as a planning board and make edits to them as we would our own meeting minutes and make sure that they we are in agreement with those. Does that sound good? I did already send feedback just to Brian, and he. I'm asking him. So if you're collecting it, that's another way to do it. I'm not sure. If, uh, Maybe no, yeah, we can we'll do it collect it. We can collect it individually and then circulate it, yep. and then let's look at it. Maybe that would be more minor. Out. It's just one. The package, sure. Okay. Um, so we'll do that. We'll give you our feedback. You'll make the edits, and then we'll put it in the packet for review at sure. our next meeting. Um, okay. Um, I had a. Um, in response to um, a lot of the comic the comments regarding the master plan, I had a wonderful conversation today with Michelle Tassi, um, who is uh, HR, but also is the staff that works with DAC. Um, and in that conversation, I'll, we'll talk more about it when we get to the master plan, because it does talk about accessibility and universal design and various things like that. But really um, a discussion about getting uh, the DAC more active in our site plan and special permit reviews mm -hmm. going forward um, and get their feedback on that and accessibility and ways that we can um, condition those projects to make them so they're really accessible. Um, so uh, we'll be looking to have a joint meeting with the DAC in the next coming and start bringing them in. The other discussion um, is putting a liaison to work with them a little bit um, or have give ask them to have a liaison that works with us um, or vice versa and both. Um, so that's an option that is on. Um, but so Brian and I will look to get the DAC on our agenda in the next, yeah. You want to say what the DAC is? The Disability, Disability Advisory. Access. No, Access. Access Commission. 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 Access Commission. There you go. On the spot. <laughs> On the spot, you know. Um, one Here's day. the president of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Brian, do you want to go through your updates? Um, so, uh, one update is that um, we have, uh, we're going to be ad uh, re advertising for uh, the recording secretary, both for planning board and for the historical commission. We've been out of one for quite some time. So, that's been some work in the making, so that's happening. Um, Hang on. So as a follow-up, are we going to be looking at minutes or getting some even really short summary of minutes for all the meetings that haven't happened? Um, we, I, I do not have, an, I don't know how that's going to work yet, but one option that was, was supposed to be happening was that we were, um, whoever we would hire could potentially work by, uh, at first, going through meeting minutes. Um, or, I mean, that's one option. That, I'm mm -hmm. not saying that's what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. um, between uh, Diab and myself, I think we have a lot of them. Good. Oh, no. Uh, but I don't. Some of them? As long as we have the main motions. I, I do right. want... I I'm going to take want, the fifth on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. the board, um, the, this is a, it's a compliance issue. Um, I read the Boston Globe, as you all know, and Weston really has gotten called on not having their minutes. Um, it had to do with the minutes. It had to do with how they were amended from an open session. I mean, I'm sorry, an executive session. Mm -hmm. and, 
Um, it ultimately went to the Attorney General's office, and they found that there, it was the select board, not the planning board, but that they were in violation. Mm -hmm. So um, this was not about taking minutes, but how they approved their minutes and then deleted something from their minutes. So it's not directly relevant to our practice, but we need minutes. And um, I'm fe I just feel as if that was something I always, even without a planner or any staff, that uh, we always had. So I just ask that we figure out how to get those minutes. So I'll talk uh, to the clerk um, about the best possible way that we could be compliant. In compliance. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, it's tough, but we owe it to our, um, that's part of what we we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, um, we're going to be getting a, a design consultant, an on-call design consultant, um, uh, like an umbrella contract that for whenever we need them um, over um, to the end of this fiscal year. Um, I, we have about uh, 10000 to do that, so it's, it's going to be a not-to-exceed contract, mm -hmm. not so whatever doesn't, um, but so that's supposed to happen by the end of this week. And can you confirm with council that assuming, and it's understood there may not be, but assuming there's a filing that this, anything related to a specific project can be charged on, um, as peer review? Okay. Um, I don't know how, why we wouldn't be it's able to. It's a cost to, to the town, yeah. right? Say that again? It's a cost to the town. We're supposed to be able to cover our costs through um, 53G. Right. Are you, so, you, I mean, are you talking about getting Anything reimb we reimbursed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then with that March 17th or March 24th, pending our schedule, we want to bring in other designers to interview. Good. March when? March 17th or March 24th. So we have more than one design consultant on call. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the week, we will have a single one on call? Is that what mm -hmm. you're saying? And Correct. that is our... That, w that is the one that is going to be doing... Well, we can name the person. Yeah, yeah. I'm just Dennis Carlone. It's Dennis. Yes, yes we'll be us. doing Converse Place. Okay. Is, okay. The yeah. goal is to get... And then a different entity for... Well, maybe. But diversify I mean, we all our have, consultants. We all have um, options, right? Um, those were the updates at the moment. So, question. Um, I know you were on vacation, but uh, Johnson Road, any kind of follow-up? No. You heard Can nothing you legal? do something? Yeah. Yeah, it's no, really, I, I still uh, not heard uh, anything to, from, the audience, from that email. We've had a house that's been abandoned. It's, um, and there is an attorney. Uh, the state has an abandoned housing initiative, and we've not pursued. Uh, Brian did send one email, I guess, to the attorney general's office. Uh, but hasn't um, or heard, heard anything back. I guess it was just no response. No, but and then also to legal counsel. Mm -hmm. So and that's both. A, yeah. yep. both. But I think a follow up to the sure, AG's no. office as well. Definitely. Um, MBTA. We've got a public meeting. Anything that is There's not part of the public meeting. We um, the only thing I know is that um, I believe it's March fourth. Yes, uh, it starts at six thirty, um, and it's at McCall School. Thank you for that. Um, and it's talking about the 90% design. Um, I don't believe that he is ready to put the 90% design out to the public yet. Um, that's uh, his um, you can get a you can review the 90% design uh, up in the manager's office. The there paper. is a set up there if you'd like to view, view the MBTA's drawings. But there is very little information on the design review subcommittee for the MBTA knows very little as well. There's nothing new to update except. We have the meeting. And then local historic district? What's going so the on? Um, the, there hasn't been an update since we, since we met two weeks ago, mm -hmm. which was that we were trying to get uh, on the select board's agenda in order mm -hmm. to talk to them about an update mm -hmm. and ask for um, gu uh, some guidance. I think at some point we also wanted a chance to talk about it, so maybe it's an agenda item because I think we also, as a planning board, have ideas about how to support the effort. Which effort? The local oh, historic okay. district. Mm -hmm. I was still on that. Um, the MBTA, though, um, in the last, we, the planning board, did take a position and voice it in the public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if right. we wanted to or not. I think I it's kind of, we just kind of, we just got it thrown on us today, pretty much. I got the notice of yeah. it. So we're not I prepared. have nothing that I could say would be coherent. Okay. Speak as a representative. Okay. We should get going. Yeah. 
Okay. All right, so we're going to go to 654 Main Street, the presentation and public comment, starting with the presentation. Um, we'll uh, know that there's a lot of residents here who I think want to speak to it or have questions regarding it. So why don't we... Um, Plus the board. What? And the board. And, yeah, and the board. Um, so what do you want to... Like Honestly, 10 minutes? 10. We, we'd be given, yeah, we were given, through the front, given so. we'd given 45 minutes, but obviously, um, that's yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I want more, out. yeah, a lot. So they said 10? Yeah, 10. And then we have to speak and then the audience. Okay. Uh -huh. Hello, welcome. If you could announce your name, your company, that would be wonderful. There's a microphone next to you and go on. Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Sutley. I'm with uh, Ad Meliora, the proponent. Can we pull up the presentation? Yeah. I'm just going to ask Brian if we can pull up the presentation. I'm not yeah, sure I'll, where be. I would find it. Yep, right there. Right yeah. here? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, and I'm going to go to here. Thank you. you. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Ted Talukian. I'm an architect from Talukian Talukian. Uh, my name is Larry Beals. I'm with Beals Associates. We're the civil engineers on the project. And um, I'd like to make a couple of other introductions, too. Uh, on the ownership side, John <coughs> Steenbrugger is with us uh, behind me, and Ian Gillespie. Uh, also, uh, was that uh, Colon is here, who's one of the architects who had a lot of input into this uh, presentation tonight. We didn't bring in an attorney tonight because we didn't think that was necessary. But um, our main point, and, and we were hoping to recap for Heather mm -hmm. because she wasn't here last time. So uh, we intended to do that, but we can probably speed through more quickly. Uh, uh, she is, I hate to, I'm sorry, uh, I know for a fact she is actually watching right now. Oh, great. Oh, she is. Yes. Great. Yeah. great. But she also has the PowerPoint show. <laughs> so I so, think let's. We want to make sure the audience can speak and that we can sure. speak. And so, we have so just so I'm clear on the timing, what, what, how much time do we have? I heard three different. Uh, you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, for, minutes for your presentation, then we'll go into questions, okay. public comment. So Ted is clearly the most important person on our team to make this presentation, so I'll okay. stop. And he can start. <laughs> we'll go quickly, and, and I think I'm just going to cover really briefly what we'd like to go through for the purposes of the audience and also for Heather, who's not here, but via the uh, television screen. Uh, we're going to do a brief overview of the 28th uh, January presentation. We're going to do a recap of some of the planning board's primary recommendations that we received in our last meeting, and those were guiding points for us uh, in the takeaway that we had from our last meeting and that we'd like to share with you today. And those are to review the proposed site plan, uh, the ground floor activation planning around the building, and also the 63 Vine Street facade implementation. And of course, cover next steps and ask for some guidance and request some questions from the audience. Uh, these photographs we just will cruise through, of course, very quickly, but they're there just to put presence. I think everybody's aware where it is and the site locations, but in case we have to go back to some of the photographs, this is a pretty good aerial photograph that shows the site, which is 64 Main Street, which is a unique property <coughs> in its uh, geometry. Uh, I think here, let's just take a very quick brief pause because this is a um, great information um, that we reviewed uh, from the town's guidelines and they became a lot of our guiding points, which is really to focus with the takeaways that we received for the central business district as well as the uh, center uh, cultural district is really to create a project that focuses on the street interface, uh, activation of the open space system surrounding the site, as well as reinforcing activity at the existing ground plane and enriching, enriching and strengthening public connections. And these became the basis of our work and how we wanted to focus on the initial planning of the project. In our last meeting, we focused on the site as a a really a activation site which is a gateway site to the cultural district as well as the central business district. Um, some of the photographs we hear like try to evoke some of the motions of some of the spaces that we find that are exciting. Walkable sidewalks, spaces that support local artists, mixed-use streetscapes, looking for outdoor um, seating adjacent to the building, as well as supporting local retail and the possibility for some public amenity spaces and public parks. 
Our analysis led us to extending the green corridor from Elliott Park, looking at some of the residential yards and the relationships, as well as maintaining traffic direction for off-street off parking and managing some of the flooding. Uh, and of course, connecting the pedestrian circulation at the ground floor retail level and really creating activated mixed use project. Uh, we reviewed two different building massing. These are only in mass, not design in terms of the building. And those are generated really around scale, around height and its presence on the streetscape. And we presented a four story uh, building volume that in created a connection to the Joe's Pizza three-story masonry building, tried to create a strong, intricate roof line that would create a connection to Wedgwood Place. And then we also looked at a five-story uh, building version that had a setback area at the upper floor. And we reviewed those, and we got some comments that the four-story was probably the preferred direction. Um, a substantial part of our conversations were around 63 Vine Street, and we noted some of the comments in the um, 7.3 Center Business District district section 511 regarding um, demolition and we received good feedback from the board around the value of 63 vine street and understanding that we may want to include um, proposals that looked at the value of 63 vine street as a transitional element as well as rebuilding some aspects of the facade mm -hmm. these are some of the takeaways that we received from the board when we met last week also we that we are to address the five-story building height and move towards a four-story design with stronger roof lines. We are looking to adjust the building facade to be parallel to Main Street, as well as build space off of Elmwood Avenue, public space, and that was appreciated to evaluate accessible route with a sight line from Main Street. Um, other comments were looking at widening the Main Street sidewalks and including street trees and a green connection to Elliott Park as well as some comments from the neighborhood were improving the sight lines at the corner of Main and Vine Streets, particularly around pedestrian and vehicular circulation, and as well as look at outdoor Main Street terrace or porch that could potentially become a retail amenity. And these are some of the comments that we received, and we wanted to highlight them as an opportunity for us to incorporate them into our presentation today. So for us, it starts at the ground plane and an opportunity to uh, really build the project from the ground level up. And I think the comments from the uh, Central Business district, district guidelines were really effective for us to look at a building that was 360 degrees, that had public interface on all sides and allowed for street-wide activi activity. And what we'd like to do today is present the spaces uh, three-dimensionally and how we're viewing them and how they relate to the ground plane of the building, starting from um, really the area that is adjacent to um, 40 Elmwood. And we call this a bit of a pocket park. We like to refer to it as a pocket arts park. And this was the public space amenity that we looked that would create, I'm going to try to use the mouse here as we use it, um, access from Main Street up Elmwood into this really, I think, very nice little public space amenity area adjacent to um, a beautiful stone wall. and. Uh, the aspects around that which were interesting to us is how, the, how we could look at that as public space that could be a part of the cultural, dist cultural district. Things that came to mind were a sculptural park, potential for local artists to make a mural, um, intricate, intricate material transitions in the landscape, and really playing up that stone wall which is beautiful against the edge and creating some outdoor speeding, seating and a gathering space and really a tree canopy that could really create uh, a provocative public space for the community. Uh, this is a three-dimensional view that takes you from Main Street, and what we'd like to do is just sort of mute down, and uh, the building itself is not designed, but just to show the access that would take you to the park, and uh, you're seeing that sort of space as you move towards it in the way that we're extending some of the brick pavers, an opportunity to create transitional paving, and a really, um, sort of, I think, elegant tree canopy. Uh, we heard some comments that that maybe area was a little bit darker, and is how could that become a vibrant space with the different types of lighting techniques and really making it a very unique space that allows you to move around the building. And this is a view that looks, you, looks back towards the space. So it's perched up about four or five feet from Main Street, and I think it's an opportunity to create another unique public space in the district that could be uh, shared and enjoyed by all. 
The second area that we want to look at, and really how its relationship is really a strong part of the project, is its reciprocal relationship at the ground floor plan. And so we looked at widening the sidewalks by about two to three feet, providing new street trees that would create a strong green connection from Elliott Park to the north. Um, we looking at designing in the future uh, a stronger edge condition that created better visibility around Vine Street. We heard some of those comments from the community um, earlier, as well as by widening the sidewalk and creating a transition that is necessary because we're in a FEMA floodplain, that we have to create a transition from about 21, 21 and change up to 23.6 because we're in the 100-year flood, mm -hmm. and that to do that, with a ramp and stair that is really a public space. And the opportunity to create some outdoor seating along the edges that could become, I think, a way to make uh, the social space at the um, sidewalk level much more activated and connected um, in that area. So the area, I think some of these images reflect ways that the retail space could have some operable glass walls that create some porosity, indoor, outdoor spaces. Um, looking at public seating and open space edges, and even going to the level that some of the um, low impact design opportunities where plantings could deal with drainage on the sidewalk as well. So this is not the building design, just to be clear. It's just an opportunity to show the beginnings of how street trees could activate this space, how there's a ramping system that would take you to this upper terrace, built up about two feet or a foot and a half is really a unique opportunity to perch out and look down the street and really broaden the streetscape and make a wider connection as you bring into this area. I think it's an opportunity for the retail space to really open up and make a strong connection back to the building and in, in a way make an outdoor room, an outdoor room that could be activated and porous with its edges. And as you see a little bit more closely um, by creating this low impact design and some plantings and the ramp system that takes you up is really becomes part of the public space and how some of the seating edges uh, where people could be could be um, edge conditions to this platform where the other tables and chairs and really engage and we see this as an opportunity where this wall could be really activated with glass and we heard some of your comments in an earlier pre earlier meeting that how to look at way columns and colonnades can really help make that a really elegant space that is a part of the public realm. Mm. The third area that we want to look at is um, adjacent to Vine Street. And this is the area where we're looking at ways that we can implement um, the 63 Vine Street building. The comments that we heard in our last meeting was how, uh, because, let me just point out, there was an intricate ramp system that took us to underground parking. That was where the existing 63 Vine Street building was. Uh, some comments that we heard was how could we, could reposition um, the building in such a way through different techniques and create an adjacency to some open space. So these areas include, you know, a private garden, seating area, as well as looking at potentially a building with a facade uh, or, a, or the way 63 Vine Street could be incorporated into the building design itself, or maybe even uh, an element that looks at removing it and the power of history suggesting the strength of the memory of the space. And those were a couple of the options that we looked at. So I'm just gonna briefly walk you through three different options. Uh, the first is looking at rebuilding um, the facade into the corner of the courtyard. And an opportunity there is that this would draw people across that space, really create an, an open space that's integrated uh, the aspects around this by putting it a little bit farther back from the street, of course, is that it doesn't give the street presence that the, that the uh, building originally had. Um, we also recognize that by building a facade, it has somewhat of a two-dimensional aspect around this, and also that may not relate directly to the program. So then we advanced it to another option that said, well, what if the building was rebuilt into the building itself or uh, created as a part of the building and the orientation of that has been moved. There's been a strong history for 63 Vine Street to be moved in the past. And we looked at an opportunity and how that could be um, re-imagined um, as a single family uh, dwelling in this location, how it could have a strong uh, front yard, and also, again, sort of find itself um, built into the building in a way that suggests um, a bit of a 
reciprocal relationship between the old and the new in that manner. I think the third one that we looked at um, as we move to this is uh, the what if opportunity that presents when you look at the building as a, as a space. Uh, and the strength of this, I think, proposal is that um, does the removal of the building create a stronger identity with the historic houses that exist on Vine Street? Does that space in the way that we can recreate, let's say, some of the aspects of the um, siding and the materiality or the windows create a strong relationship um, back to the other houses. And I think that's a unique situation here is that the proposition in question is um, when you have a situation where you reimagine it, what happens when you create absence of it? And does it suggest a stronger relationship to its authentic history? And so those are just things for us to review together, and we are interested in your feedback, uh, of course. And I also just want to point out in this design presentation, we haven't really gotten into the building and the roof lines and the intricate roof lines, but it's something that we want to further advance is when we come back. But I think that we wanted, as I pointed out, to really begin to design the building from the ground plane up and how the building um, creates a public, uh, I'd say a positive public connection um, at the ground plane and to think about how the building is designed there. Um, and just as a recap, I would like to add just in terms of programming and just in terms of where we are, we're looking at just as a two commercial spaces uh, with approximately 36 dwelling units, 34 off-street parking spots, a uh, maximum FAR of 2.5, and the designs that we've been showing you at the ground plane are, represent a over 20% public open space as defined by the zoning ordinances and also a building height that is uh, significantly less than 60 feet. And thank you. I hope that was brief enough for you. No, it's thank you. Okay. Um, Planning Board, do you want to speak or do you want to let it go to the public first? I'd like to have a chance to speak. Okay, no. you can speak and then we'll open it to the public. Okay, so I go back to the starting point is the zoning bylaw, the cent uh, Center Business District 7.3. Purpose of the zoning bylaw includes uh, number four, promote and protect Winchester Center's historic resources and small town character. Uh, starting from the very purpose of, um, of uh, 7.3, Center Business District, we're there to, we're here to protect the small town character, the historic resources. Furthermore, this was adopted by um, town meeting. And in town meeting, they were presented with a uh, section 7.3.18 historic resources. Plans that include demolition of historic structures are strongly discouraged. Uh, and there's a map in seven that goes with it, 7.3.4. And from the time when we first met, before you were here and meeting with Mr. Gillespie, we said we have the historic resource and that's going to be a part of the um, objective of, of developing this site. Then we have a master plan committee that we're about to wrap up on our master plan and vote on it. This is how we began. We began with a survey, and I can't remember how many thousand people. Uh, 1,100. 1,100 people responded to the survey. And in the survey, it said historic resources. 91% of respondents agreed that preserving the historic quality of the town center is important. So what I see here has no bearing on our master plan, on our community outreach, on our zoning bylaw. So I just think we're not communicating at this table. And I want to go back in your show. You said something about preserving a, yeah, you may as well go back so we can all see it because uh, I keep getting these uh, reviews of our meetings, keep going way, way, way back to the beginning. You may as well scroll up and yeah, go back uh, to what you heard from the last meeting. Back. And yeah, and here we are, know what the feedback was. There we are, yeah. And, I, I said that my last words to you were, we want to preserve the building. I said it in plain English. It's in the zoning bylaw. Let's preserve the building and we'll work with it. And I gave you something that was an example of something I clipped out of a magazine that was an example from Cambridge 7 and what they did out in Western Mass in Williamstown. So we just aren't communicating. Um, then if you could go forward a little bit. Um, uh, forward? Yes, please. Um, the built the is a shot that you have of 63 Vine Street. Okay. 
Uh, I'm sorry, just the picture of which, which 63 photo? Vine, okay. the yeah. photo. Yeah, okay, right there. Yeah, so, okay, now we get the front of it, uh, but it says study, demo, and rebuild some aspect of facade. No, that's preserve the building. Yes, I, Heather did say that, and she said, if you want to get the votes from this board, and she was clear, it was not necessarily how she felt, but she felt that the board, meaning what you would need, which is four out of five votes, would be expecting to see some good faith effort in working with this building. Now, Brian, I ask you to load just a couple of slides. They're fast, and I certainly, it'll take, take two minutes if you can just pull yeah, those the, up. I just need the mouse. Oh, then you need the mouse. Um, I'll continue to talk while that's on the screen, though. Um, the virtues of the house, first of all, it is one of our oldest buildings in the town. And um, at, we've done a, a screen of uh, MACRIS, the Massachusetts Historical Commission's website, of how many buildings are left of this period. They're probably about 30 in total. That's a rough estimate. <coughs> it's, a, it's really an old building. And even though I understand it's been treated badly, that's something we, uh, I mean, it's some reason why we had to do what we did in the zoning bylaw, because otherwise we get demolition by neglect. And that's what's been going on here. But ultimately, if this town is going to do what our master plan is saying citizens want us to do, we're going to have to deal with the decl decline and decay of these um, historic buildings and then see them reconstructed. So restored. This is an example of what that house looked like. This is from Preservation Mass's website, and this was after a project um, that was done. I'm not familiar with it, but you can see how simple it is. Get the yellow stuff off the house and re-side it. Siding isn't that hard, and the surround on that house, which is what our, our house in Winchester would have had, is very simple to rebuild. Um, Brian, can you advance? So it is uh, the nature of historic frame buildings that they get resided and they get new roofs. This is a 17th century house in Saugus. 17th century houses have lasted a long time. And then even historic New England, historic New England owns this building, even they understand there's a limit to what you can do with uh, wood. So you reside. In this case, you're getting a new, um, new roof. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a house in Winchester. A Builder just bought it, and he's flipping it. And even for him, it was cost effective to pull the siding off and put new siding on. So it can be done. This isn't that hard. Next slide. Um, this is up the street from me. They do it. This is another one. It's easy to do. So we, I think the point is residing and putting a new roof on this. You do what you want inside, but preserving the house really isn't a big effort. Uh, next slide. So we're asking you to, we have a, um, it's color coded, it's in the zoning bylaw to do, and we're charged with upholding the zoning bylaw. We promised the town meeting this is something that we would try to do. So we'd like to see the building restored. Next slide. Here it is, it's not that different. Get the yellow stuff off. The windows are actually still there, <clears throat> roof's still there. Some of the virtues of this, different from your park, are there's this whole Jane Jacobs concept, which I'm sure you're familiar with, of eyes on the street. You get that building occupied again, and it creates a much more attractive corridor for anyone moving up into the Vine Street neighborhood. Um, when you have a park there, you've got a bed, another dead space, and right across the street is a dead space, which is the entrance to a big parking garage of Wedgwood Place. So putting the house with the eyes on the street, it's the historic building, it's residential, it's re it connects with the residential neighborhood up above the, um, on Vine Street. Um, this is all a much more appealing um, transition, and we do have stuff in the zoning bylaw. I'm not going to bother everybody with that, but we're supposed to also be making sure in our zoning review um, that this creates a good transition into the, the, any new construction respects these borders or boundaries of our districts. We're going from CBD into a residential district. So it's that, I think I had one more, or is that at the end? <clears throat> it's it. So um, that's my own take on it, that this would be the starting point and that we work from the house and the virtues of that house, um, what it does for the street, what it does for the neighborhood, what it does for the pedestrian um, pedestrians who are moving up and down that neighborhood. Um, and it's also, I should add, part of a cultural district, and this is in the boundaries of the cultural district. Historic resources are considered part of one of the things you do in a cultural district. You preserve the, cult, um, the historic resources. So I can't count to five for you, but I can tell you and to, we, we spoke well early. I still have, I, in fact, I printed out the email. We, uh, we spoke in May of uh, 2019, and I think you had a pretty good idea of what 
some of us at least were hoping to see in this development, and this isn't it. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I have a slightly different take. Um, so in my mind, what's important to that neighborhood is to see uh, a transition. Um, and so the question I ask I, myself is, what makes that transition successful? And in my mind, what makes that transition successful is the look of the building that's going to be there. So I, you know, for me, a facade would work. The, the, the neighborhood won't see the back of the building. They will see the side and the front. I think you know from Maureen's point of view that um, there is a strong bias towards preserving buildings and you do have to show that there are substantial beneficial impacts if you take it down. So when I'm looking at the designs that you came up with, and I understand that they're just preliminary. Would I be able to pull that back? If yeah, because it doesn't help if I look at it. And yeah, no, I can, I can go to the slide for you. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Not so much. Uh, I just want to make sure, Brian, I'm up. Oh, there we go. Okay. So why don't we take a look at I, the, the, you had three, I believe you had three um, yes. different things. So the first one, I think. You want this sir, plan? No, the ones where you showed your ideas. The last slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that I can. Yeah, OK. So. Right here, um, if I look at this, I don't see a transition. What I see is, as you said, it looks like a very flat thing glued onto the building. So that doesn't work well. Um, the next one, um, I don't think does justice to the structure. And what it doesn't do is it doesn't, it certainly, you get the facade in it, but it doesn't make it as prominent as it needs be. Um, and the last one, while I, you know, it's an intriguing concept, but I don't think it works in this town. Um, it, just because people want to see the actual building. Um, although I do appreciate the thought that went behind that, because it looks, it's intriguing to me. So I think I would be happier if you were able to take that middle, the second option, and you know, bring it out so that it is actually something which looks like, I mean here, to be honest, it looks like it's been swallowed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and um, I can, again, I, I'm a big fan of modern architecture, so I can understand how you can put things together, but I don't think that this town really is into that. So I think there's a, there's a concern there that you meet with the expectations. So um, I'm not as wedded to maintaining the entire structure. What I would like to see is that, um, and I don't mind the turning of it, because in a sense, turning it this way does this give the neighborhood, the neighborhood exactly. a better view of it. And the question is, who is that building there for? Is it there for the people driving down Vine Street, or is it for the people who are actually going to see it most of the time? What is the most important presentation <clears throat> And so um, I would bring it out more. Um, my other, my, I do have a concern that if you see it sideways and it's brought out more, it's gonna look like a slot house. And so it will look odd considering the other buildings on the block are rotated with their facades, their main facades towards the street. So that's sort of a tension. I don't know how you work around that. Um, so, uh, you know, I think in order to achieve a compromise that will get you the votes you need on the board, you are going to have to do something with that building. I don't know if just rebuilding it as is, I think it's important to reuse some of that original materials because mm -hmm. that's what's historically important. Mm -hmm. um, and the design, I mean, it's, it's um, and I'm actually, 
saying I'm compromising with my own views on this because I would like this project to go forward. So, um, and the only other thing I'd note is that you got this, you got the zip code wrong on your mural on the back. Oh, that's an it's an <laughs> image from a different uh, artist yeah. that we didn't. It's just not meant. Yeah. It came from another. Project. But those are my comments on the on. I think this is the most important issue yeah. that will either make or break this project just because of being able to retain that. Yeah, I think story. the. It, can I start with the comment around mm -hmm. orienting it and which side the transitional element can occur to? I think there's, it's interesting when it's rotated, mm -hmm. coming down Vine Street and facing the residential neighborhood has a certain strength. Um, and the way the space and the lawn could work adjacent to that would be, I think, a little bit more grand than mm -hmm. necessarily up against a, a thinner sidewalk. So there, it's a question which is interesting if it's rotated or not rotated. Uh, due just to the site geometries and where the building is flushing out currently, it's more difficult, I will say, to run it parallel to mm -hmm. Vine Street just based on the parking ramp and the necessary square footages of, of how these work. Um, so, and so when, can I ask you a question around the idea of its placement? And you were bringing up something around, you know, how far it's pulled out or within. Yeah, I, I just want to. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I, I want to um, push back a bit on your, your concern about whether it's rotated or not, because you have the facade on your first one. You do actually have the facade directly parallel to the oh, street. I want to see what you're, yeah. yeah. So go back one. Yeah, so here you do have it oriented the way it is right now. It overlaps the property line. It's hard to tell. It not overlaps the property. It runs past the perpendicular line of the property. So it's actually longer than the width of the property that's remaining. But okay, that, that's just, I, I just... I cannot the, visualize that yeah. right now. But um, I mean, this I don't think works because it's, 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 it disappears into the bulk of the building. I agree. So um, what you asked a question about bringing it out. And here, I think bringing it out means detaching it a lot from the building. I think, I don't know how it would work architecturally, but certainly being able to see that the gable mm -hmm. as a separate roof structure from the main building. Because yes. I, I, otherwise, it looks like- It's in there. It's in there or it's just a facade wrapped around it and it doesn't have it doesn't represent a somewhat independent structure. Yeah, we looked at actually pulling it out to the ridge line of mm -hmm. the building that sort of then at that point allows all of the roof to be visual, visibly seen mm -hmm. and it has a little bit less um, engulfed kind of view of how the building works and that was something that we can continue to study too. Okay. So I'll just volunteer. You are going to end up looking for four boats and it's not going to cut it with me. Um, just responding to yeah, No, I know, but I feel like I'm being left out of a dialogue as opposed to a presentation. And I also want to just emphasize there is, I suspect you are familiar with Jane Jacobs and the idea of yeah. putting eyes on the street. And once you shift it, you're losing a lot of the opportunity to close the gap that's created on the northern side of the street. The southern side is where your pedestrian will mm -hmm. right now go because the, even without the building being occupied. So I, I know it in, is involved because I study urban design and theory and it's not just theory, it's reality. We so, know that that's where people by their psychology logically will go. No, I, li I like what you're saying. I just want to just address the questions around the orientation of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, as you elaborate a little bit more around it, I, does this seem something that it wants to remain parallel to Vine Street, in your opinion? It wants to be where it is. Okay. Um, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, first of all, your perspectives are not at eye level. They're all flying high. So, um, just so... Okay, wait, look at that person. Just And you're very... All the beginning ones are all high. They're all sh shooting over the head. So, if you go back to the beginning. And so, I just... It's very deceptive... And I just want to make sure. These are about. No, you can see you're shooting high because you're looking above the people's heads and you can draw all the lines. Take all the, I mean, no, take all these to. lines and draw them and you're coming up over here, which is over here. You're not coming mm -hmm. at the eye level okay. of, 
of the people. And so I just want to make sure you, because okay. that is deceptive. And I want, I would like, I'd rather that you come in and we address the four stories and we address them honestly versus trying to sell it because you won't get past Heather and I without okay. having accurate perspectives. About our history, Masato, vanishing point, right? Well, anyway, so just, I just want to make sure. Um, and then with that comment, then on the other side is you showing your four stories without your roofs and you're just doing it as a mass block Currently. without your roof lines that also hinders you because with your roof line, you'd have more of an interest and in the height would be reduced in visually, but right now you're doing it as a block. So on that side, that doesn't help you. But so those are two countering um, things. You talked about the overhead and like you don't have a colonnade drawn in or anything on this. So that also with this perspective, right? So when the public is viewing it from here, if they're not architects or designers, they're looking at it being like, we have this overhang that's just free floating. What, what does it mean when you're saying call? I know what it means when you say it, but the public doesn't. So I just want to, okay. that hinders you in your presentation. Um, going with that. Um, so I, I have a couple questions for you. You are going for 20% open public space. What is your actual open space? Okay. So we are taking a minimum of 15 feet yeah. in our calculation. So the property setback, line, the, the, the setback from the property line is 20 feet, mm -hmm. and the wall thickness is around three plus feet. So we are imp including this area here all the way around to this zone here. And then similarly, we're taking all of this space here as part of our public open space. So you're saying that the reason you're, that you are moving the house the way you are is to get your open space percentages. Is that why you're recommend, you're giving your proposals the way you are? Because it goes against what the board told you to do in the last presentation. Okay. Um, so just to answer the question around the, the building location currently, uh, it's currently, you know, an L-shaped building that is a right, right around this location. One of the challenges with um, the proposal as a mixed-use project is that to provide off-street parking. And so the parking ramp is off of Elmwood, and it goes underground, and there is a parking area below grade. And that was discussed in our last mm -hmm. meeting as one of the reasons why the building would have to, in order to achieve, I should say, mm -hmm. yeah. parking was, this is what was just presented last time, was that we uh, needed to either remove and rebuild the structure. And that was um, the reason around that was due to the underground parking. So um, in a different proposal at a different site, they're talking about a car elevator mm -hmm. instead of doing the ramping system, yes. which would help alleviate that height variation that you have off of Vine, mm -hmm. which is creating that wall. So instead of not having the house in red, mm -hmm. you're now getting a big stone wall right. yeah. on, the, on the view. So um, is that an option? Is there an option to um, hide that ramp behind the facade of the building? So yes, the first story is, you know, I mean, they do it where you have the historical facade, but the interior is very modern, very dealt with where you have, that is a car ramp behind it. Yeah. And are you able to do that? It, um, the automated parking or an elevator lift? I'm just giving you options. You could we do the elevator the, lift. You yes. could do the front facade of the, the yeah. building in red. And instead of having a wall and have it hidden behind the windows, you could do, I mean, there's a lot of other, you're, right. you're trying, you know, the, um, you're going into a modern approach of how you're dealing with it in terms of the cutout, right? And leaving it as a void, that is incredibly depressing. <laughs> um, and in terms of art world, that to me is really depressing because you are taking something that some people do hold value to mm -hmm. in this town and you're making it be empty. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just um, from a, my perspective, from an art world, it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, so that is not, <laughs> but, but just to answer your question, I want to make sure I yeah. address it. So we have been looking at alternative parking yeah. as opposed to self park with ramp systems and we'll continue to evaluate that. And uh, there's an opportunity there in terms of how that could position um, the 63 Vine Street building relative to that. And if you put the historical building in, attached it, yeah. move your building back to it slightly, right? You'd get your open space up in front as well, which gives you more opportunity. You could do outdoor seating and stuff, and that's more of a public space from a uh, using the restaurants but not mm -hmm. open to the public. 
is that something that you might look into yeah, to I, do that? And then you, I mean, so I see you're trying to create these public spaces. What if you actually put it on the front of the building to get the, the building in red back? But, I'm sorry, just so I follow you, to take the 63 Vine Street and move it to, to Main Street? No, uh, leave the 65 where it currently sits. 63? Yes, okay. and move your entire building back mm -hmm. toward leaving the historical building. So you're embedding that building as part of your square footage. Mm -hmm. Move it back and put your, your square footage in the front mm -hmm. of the building for public seating or mm -hmm. restaurant mm -hmm. seating out front. Yep. And but that's the way you're, because you, what you're doing is I, based on what I'm looking at is you're really set on where your open space is and does it have to be where it is and can you embed it? And then can you be more creative if you are having problems with your ramping system or your parking to then embed it behind the facade of the building? Sure. It just, I think in terms of the parking entry itself, it seemed to work out best on Elmwood because there's a strong press. I think your location is, Elmwood. yes. Fine. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would agree. And then uh, just in the initial evaluation of how a self-park system mm -hmm. that has a ramp would, you're looking at the dash line of the ramp itself. There is a run to get mm -hmm. down, which is somewhat significant. So if you're at 24 and a half, so the parking entry has to be above the floodplain. Mm -hmm. And so at 21 or 22, 23, you just can't get that until you get up to about 24 and a half. Mm -hmm. And then having that ramp run that is fairly long to get down to an elevation which is below you know, the elevation that you need for structure with a van accessible spot. Yep. So I think that is what's causing the building to be sort of evaluated in this manner. Mm -hmm. And um, we can continue to look at other options around parking, particularly self park, in which we've been in conversations around, and how that would free up ways of evaluating where the building could be located. Yeah. Um, I saw, though, in your elevations, you're taking the scale of the building and starting to draw your lines to it mm. um, later on. Um, so you're getting some of your scale, because you are taking scale off of that elevation, is my understanding. <coughs> right, correct? When you go to your, the three options that you yeah. provided. Yeah. You're grabbing some of the scale proportions of the window sizing. Um, here? In, in, yes, in and here. See, so your yeah. lines are lining up. So what I am saying is if you need to get your ramp in there, don't go off inside the building, whether you align with those windows or not. Don't. Just get the facade in place and, and get your ramp behind that facade. As a I, I think, am I hearing correctly? I mean, a more meaningful sort of implementation of the building would be, it'd, it'd be encouraged mm -hmm. than a facade. Well, if you position. got the elevator, yeah. if you did an elevator, you could actually make that be your entrance yeah. point for all your residents. Yeah. Could come in through the that front that the entry yeah. door. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, also, I think it could become a dwelling unit, mm -hmm. which would be part of the, its original history, as opposed to you know something yeah. that's more public. Yeah, would be occupied. That's part of the eyes yeah. on the street. Again, you've got we we're dealing with a neighborhood. We're not just dealing with a, a client. Um, and in the neighborhood, they need to have occupied space to make that a pedestrian access. And I should add, there's the synagogue and there's a congregational church and people, there are more people than... I, I think it'd be advisable to have it occupied, and that's the way I would view it as well. I mean, oh, I this think. is something that would be, could be a great amenity space, it could be a great uh, public amenity room, it could be a single family dwelling uh, that people come into. And I think it's really coming down to, you know, am I hearing correctly, is that we, we want to see this form as a transitional mm -hmm. element and really it's a cha it's a dimensional challenge yeah. as much as anything and i think we and just want to look at you know how it's positioned and really what is enough of it and i you want it wants to have enough identity on the site mm -hmm. um that is a balance between you know this new pr proposal with the existing buildings that are adjacent to it and um, I think its meaning would really come a lot around, you know, how it's being used as much as it's just as a pure form. Yeah. And maybe the you actually do a U shape or whatever you need to do, right? And put the open space in the middle, mm -hmm. and then that becomes more of a private space yeah. for those occupants as the other areas for public. I am not tied. You have a lot of public space. I'm not tied for all that space yeah. to be public if you can get that, yeah. the historical facade, yeah. in its current location as... You know, and, and the other thing just I want to point out on, on the grades, right, because there is, let me just go back to the site plan for a second. So the, actually the grading, there's quite a, 
a grade change yeah. right here. This is about elevation 33, mm -hmm. right where the driveway exists. So you got a, a run here that's going up to about elevation 33 right here. And so when this is 33, the question could arise, like how a transition could be made mm -hmm. between this property that's more like elevationally consistent. Mm -hmm. So 33 isn't necessarily a very high elevation. It's actually more consistent with the adjacent property heights and you're getting some odd transitions occurring right yeah. now, just as a... Yeah, it's a unique site. It gives you challenges. Yeah, there's some challenges there. I think yeah. also it's interesting, you know, because I think your point, Heather, around like public space, I want to just kind of touch on a couple of the public space issues. I understand the priority around the building, and it's important. But there are some benefits of, I just want to point out, of widening, let's say, the, the sidewalk, uh, implementing some street trees. I think the idea of a ramp system that gets you up is a necessity. It we have sense. to be there, right, because you're in a FEMA 100-year floodplain. So that's a necessity. And putting it inside a retail space is push you farther away from the wall. So we wanted to create that transitional space as being a part of the public space. And I think there's a lot of advantages of how the ground plane can work at that level that we still need to develop. And I would agree, Heather, that we're not there yet in terms of developing the colonnade and the way to space. And that's something I'm mean, looking forward to coming back and developing and showing you. Also, as this space kind of uh, works out, it seems like it's great borrowed space that could be just given back. I mean, you've got an opportunity here where we're uh, able to put a small amount of interior off-street parking at this level. Um, we're able to shape the geometry in such a way that allows people to pull into this space and then really move 360 degrees around the building. Mm -hmm. And so if you can make a building not have a back necessarily and have a front and a side and a rear and they all work together in a way that contributes to the cultural district, that's what we're trying to present as an opportunity and that we want to be able to build the building from the ground up. And so if we can get you know, site circulation to work so that the retail spaces flow and open the way this other retail space has operable you know, windows along this wall that point toward the street. I look for a lot of co-benefits in the design. How does the building you know, take advantage of, let's say, Vine Street sight line that we heard very strongly from the community is like, how do you make better sight lines? And then how does it offer, also offer an opportunity to become part of the gateway in terms of the way the building is received? So I just want to walk you around a couple other locations and how that works. Additionally, um, I think this could be a tremendous space back here, you know, like where people could, you know, enjoy. And with the strike you know, it might be a tunnel, though, because you have four stories and then you have this. The this is about. I mean, but, but you're going to get an area that instead of just being lost space, can it contribute back? And that's a question for you as a board, if whether or not you feel that's appropriate, you know, response is to provide that or not. I think it were, I think the team is looking at ways that we can contribute to the cultural district mm -hmm. and that we just saw this as one way. Um, okay. And can we go open up to comments real quick? Um, anyone from the audience, would you like to make a comment? If so, can you please come to the table? Come on forward. And my apologies, after this we will move on to the master plan once we give opportunity for those to speak, but they came to speak. Yes, John Clemson, I'm on the Winchester Historical Commission and I'm a town meeting member, Precinct 3. And I think a lot of my points have been made. Uh, I'll just add that this building it, it's a difficult building to understand and appreciate, but... Can I get a slide of it? Maybe but, Brian? Will you let him, give him an image? Let him talk. Oh, he's trying to talk to something. We're trying to visualize. Brian? Okay, I, I, I what still... Would you like, I can, still oh, you it. have it. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you, he had it. Which picture. slide, sir, would you like to see? Uh, the picture of the house. <laughs> okay. 63. Right there? There yeah. we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to emphasize how what a rare survival this is. It's part of the first, the initial period of development in the town. Uh, a lot of Winchester, the center of Winchester looked like this at one point. And I think there are probably three or four buildings that survive in the center. So, you know, I think it's worthy of our attention and concern. And it, it really serves as a document of this period of Winchester's um, first phase of development after the railroad came in. And it, it's really about, in addition to eyes on the street, it's about pattern and historic building patterns 
and the streetscape that in addition to being driven down is walked down so you know uh, I just want to emphasize how important this building is and um, you know it's worthy of preservation so thank you John just want to add right. that Did anyone, yeah. else, anyone else want to speak I'm Marcia Kuhn. I live at 4 Wedge Pond Road. So we walk this all the time. We walk into town to do things. We go to Fells. We are very pro developing the site, but I think everyone needs to look at this. What do you want in your neighborhood? And I appreciate your presentation. It's hard to argue with a nice park and a colonnade and a cut of the building so that improves the visibility. But I find it a little deceiving also in some of them where the scale of the house that's up above this looks almost as large as this four-story building that's going on the corner. And I, I just really, I need the things to be in scale. That last one you were just at. Yeah. That is not that poor family's house. They are up a hill, they are looking down, and your building, and I realize it's just massing, just is going to surround them. And we're already seeing a wall on Vine with the building that's on Elmwood. And everyone said, oh, it's three stories. It's a really tall three stories when you're on Elmwood looking at parking and then the residential. And it's also really big when you walk on Vine and you have that wall there. So I need everyone to look at it from that perspective. Um, I also just, I know from going into Boston, there are older buildings that have been maintained where they are, and then the new building is integrated above and around. What I'm seeing here is kind of an odd way to represent the house. And when I see that, and I realize again it's massing, I see a wall. I'm still walking down the hill and I'm seeing a wall. I'm not seeing a nice house, historic house, that I would love to see saved and then have you build behind it or something else. So um, my last comment is just 36 units. The last building was 25. You cannot put that many people in our little neighborhood and not give them two parking spots. Winchester, mom and dad have a car. Every high schooler has a car. You have two high schoolers. I'm up to four cars. You don't <laughs> even have one spot per unit. So 36 units I think is way too many. And parking has, it cannot go on the street. I think the people who live on Vine deserve parking passes so only they can park there. <laughs> Cambridge. I know Wedge Pond, which says no parking on either side we are on our sidewalks when we have company because there is not enough parking. When the temple has an event, people are all up and down every street. There's just not enough room. And I understand the desire of everyone in Winchester to build and have all these great things, but they live way out of town and they're not thinking this big development and oh, 36 great new units is gonna impact them because it's not. It's gonna impact the small number of us who live in that neighborhood and love it for what it is. And I think it's easy to sit on Johnson Road or you know, in <laughs> the flats and go, yes, build. Winchester needs to get bigger and better and everything else because they're not dealing with it every day and they're not walking down the street with their dog <laughs> twice a day seeing something that's way too out of scale. So, um, and the scale from the front, if you're gonna show the four story height compared to the 666 building, tell me you're gonna set it back the 10 to 15 feet that that building is set back. Otherwise, it's not a fair comparison because that has trees, that has a parking drop off. This has more trees, but only has two more feet on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So that's a little deceptive, so. I wish you luck because it's a, a hard, hard project <laughs> and I want something, but I, I have to speak up with. What's your name? Marsha Kuhn. K-U. Agent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Oh, yeah. 
Hi. Hi. Edie Dungess, about 42 Vine Street, mm -hmm. not far from Marsha and Polly and from Fells Hardware Store. I too am a proponent of keeping the Fells house and have to reiterate the parking that's a problem currently, never mind with 36 more units. And we already don't know what the parking will be like when these 15 units or 20 units that are about to be open house and start to move in. So I'm very concerned about that. And I'm also concerned about the fact that there will be retail space there and I'm assuming that it, it will be Fells Hardware. So where is that 18 wheeler tr delivery truck going to be putting, bringing its, their supplies, which comes very early in the morning? And also, where is the trash? I'm good, yeah. And um, so, and I like the fact that the driveway is on Elmwood rather than being on Vine Street, but um, I'm assuming Elmwood will stay to be a one-way only so that you have to go in from, um, from what, that would be the other side of Vine Street and near the, near the Congregational Church and go down to get into their driveway. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are my concerns. Just, I think, to answer a couple questions if they're brought up, is the uh, loading could occur on Elmwood and be brought into both retail off of Elmwood. The trash is kept inside the building in a ventilated space that will be ventilated through the roof and then brought through a trash service. Yeah, yeah the, the, trash trash, service. The, the trash service, that's the guy <laughs> that we have at 5 a.m. across the street from the apartment building that we used to have and uh, very disruptive. Right, so I mean, but the, the idea would be much of the loading would occur on Elmwood and not on the Vine Street side. And then also uh, I would be concerned about the, I'm assuming that the loading, the, the parking driveway, that's for residential parking. The, mm -hmm. So the current uh, retail parking during the day, that seems to be a problem even though we have signs, you can only park for so many hours and on Main Street mm -hmm. or minutes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'll keep it. We'll, we'll do one more and then we gotta move on to our. Amory Brocco, uh, 23 Elmwood. Uh, we are like a new community, I feel. I've only been in Winchester almost two years in June. And in Elmwood, um, at 23 Elmwood, we have five condo units. And we all, it's all sold out, we all know each other. This now Allegro building is 10 units, um, also in Elmwood. And it's new, two are already sold. So we'll, we hope to get to know those other uh, eight units. But having another building, 35 units, to me just seems way out of scale of that community. 35. And we are a new community. And the track, you know, I understand uh, the concerns on Vine, <laughs> and I appreciate oh those. <laughs> but on Elmwood, we have those concerns as well. We are a new, smaller community. And I think 35 is like just way out of scale. And if you're gonna have, uh, more traffic there for parking and everything. I think that parking really has to be consideration in the at the next planning board. And I, you know, I look forward to it, but just not, please not 35 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, we're gonna go back because we're coming way off our schedule um, and need to move on to our master plan. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for thank your you. comments. And we look thank forward. Um, at the next time, um, if possible, can we get them um, on Friday for a Tuesday meeting? Yes, so they I, can, I, I know you are on vacation, add, so yeah. I don't want to. I, I want to just that, and I asked late in the game. But yes, we'll so make sure you time, get that a Friday then, in advance. Um, Actually, and, for the other project as well, so you may as well direct it to mm -hmm. the project. Yeah, but it's developers. Just, no, I, for this, Heather I, and and Maureen and and to the whole board, we'll make sure that you get them the Friday before our Tuesday meeting, so you have enough time to review it in advance. Thank, right, thank you. you.
Brian, could you send around this version to sure. us? Because it's yeah, that's a and post it. Maybe it, it was a little bit refined. Yeah. Yeah. It should. Yeah. It should. This should go on should on our website. I think they sure, do go sure. on our website. Yeah, it's just that I looked at this online. Is, the other this one is, we sent was a draft version. I would yeah. recommend that you use this version. This is the, the, the big the guy. Version. He gets the big bucks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Maureen. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are going to move on to the master plan. Um, pu public printouts of the presentation. Of what? Would you like printouts of the presentation? Oh. <laughs> I'll take a printout. Um, yeah. You can leave them with Brian. That'd be great. Actually, uh, what's his first name? Oh, one more. When you do your elevations, can you please do the not just your building, but go farther out, please? Yes. Yeah, okay. We'll make sure that. Thank you. Oh, okay. oh. Now I'm recognizing where you're from. Where you're from. Oh. Um, all right. So um, my my thought on how to work the next portion, and my apologies to all of you who are waiting to speak regarding um, the master plan. But thank you so much for your patience. It was really it's really important for those um, to have a voice and. And the projects, but um, going forward, what we're going to do is we are going to open up um, comments from the audience. The planning board has also received a lot of comments um, from residents to our attention, um, and gather those. And then the planning board thereafter is going to have a discussion um, about those comments. Um, and uh, if we have questions after the comments of those, you're welcome to ask. But I'd rather that we go through have if you have comments and concerns, you voice them. And then um, we go into discussion format thereafter. Um, so uh, if anyone had any comments that they wanted to share, please come forward and state your name and your address. And we look forward to them. Your bullet points, do you mind do I hand them out, or is it something that's inappropriate? Yeah, you can no, hand them out. No, no, I don't know. I mean, well, there's so every board out, operates it's differently. It's agenda stuff, it's and a public record, that's all. Mm -hmm. No, every board operates differently. I have so. five. It's me, like so chewing gum. You have to have one for everyone. <laughs> oh. Sorry. And um, just so you know, Heather is watching. She has the flu in, which is why she's not which here. Which is why we don't want to see her. Which is why we uh, asked her to please. <laughs> so it's not meant to be. Watching. She's not just hanging out. She's. So <laughs> these are these are just really quick bullet points. My name is Deborah Johnson. I live at 14 Wickham. And I'm a physical therapist. Help me with Wickham. Wickham is uh, by the town forest off Grove Street. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm a physical therapist, so I, I looked at this mainly just from a disability ADD, ADA standpoint, and I made some bullet points that I, there's a bunch of different drafts, so hopefully nothing's been changed. But I just wanted to, I went to the meeting at the Jenk Center mm -hmm. um, in November, I think it was, and I was a little um, upset to not see disability aspect really addressed more from my perspective when I looked at it. I did go to the DAC meeting, that following like December 9th or whatever it was and voice my opinion there too because I felt like the DAC wasn't really involved. I could be wrong. I haven't gone to all the meetings. So anyway, looking at this under goal one, you talk about adding, well, the, the, the proposal was to add another planner and there was a list of expertise. I would like ADA experience listed as one of the expertises as well. Like for instance, it talks about historic you know, preservation being something that would be good to have in a planner. I would love to have a planner that also has expertise or past experience, whatever training, school in ADA um, aspect. Uh, under number three, uh, there's other people in town who are much better about adaptive housing in terms of the information about this, but it really was confusing. It wasn't clear to me the emphasis on the single family housing with ancillary. It talked about how there's a structure that has uh, a certain amount, like six units, it has to be affordable and things like that. And then it kind of, within the same sentence, talks about ancillary structures. So I just wanted to, I didn't understand that clearly. And I maybe have a little bit more you know, so I just wanted to say that it wasn't clear to me if that was being addressed, and if it wasn't, it should be. And and Kathy Boyle is very involved. Kathy Boyle. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. I'm sorry. So she is the person who really is the expert on that. Um, number eight, 
I love, love, love the fact, because Winchester is really, really inaccessible. The sidewalks in downtown area in particular, they look lovely, the bricks. The bricks are just the biggest tripping hazards, even just for able-bodied people to walk around. I mentioned the um, uneven sidewalk, for instance, we're in a scoop of Palooza. You can, even as a stepping stone, if you replace that with a, a tree grate, and you, you, know, you can adjust the levels on that so that someone who's using a walker or a wheelchair can get over those roots. But right now you have bricks sticking up at 20 different angles because of the tree roots. So some of these may be long-term goals, but I would love to see short-term solutions in there as well. Um, and obviously the, the curve ramps downtown. Anyway, th there's a lot of issues there. Goal eight includes a lot of them, but perhaps a short and a long-term solution in there would be great. Number 10 was one of the big areas that I wrote about. You mentioned the train travel in one of your paragraphs. Sorry, there wasn't like an A, B, and C, so. Yeah. But there's like a train travel talking about how they're trying to, to you know, get that electrified and move along there. Then there's an issue about the bus travel. There's not a lot of issue about interconnectivity between those things. And one of the things that's going on right now, I know that Chamber of Commerce is having a meeting for the MBTA right now about the train, October 4th, as you mentioned, about the train. ADA, unfortunately, ADA is like the minimum amount required. It doesn't necessarily make everything functional. So ADA, like if you're in front of a school and you have an entrance into the school, the presumption is you're gonna take the same entrance getting out of the school. So that's how ADA looks at handicap parking in relationship to accessible entrances. Well, the train station is an anomaly and it's not really dealt with in ADA law because you have, you're getting into your, from your car into the outbound area and into the inbound area separately. So with them moving the ramps, now there will no longer be a ramp down by the post office lot, right? That's just gonna be staircase and elevator. There will no longer be any kind of ramp behind um, the jewelry store, you know, the area I'm talking about, that's going to be replaced with a staircase, I believe. Yeah, because we but can't get away. But they can't fit the yeah. ramp, which I understand. But now they're talking about the ramp being up on Shore Road. So picture, if you will, that according to ADA law, you have to have parking, accessible parking near accessible entrances. So if you're over by D'Agostino's in that lot, that may become affordable housing, but right now it's still a parking lot. If you park there, you can take an elevator, go into Boston. Say you come back from Boston and that elevator is not working, which happens four times and you obviously can't get that fixed immediately. Your other option is to go down the entire length of the train station, now go over the rotary brand new pedestrian bridge and take the ramp down that leads you to Shore Road. Well now you have to get back from Shore Road exit back to your original handicapped parking spot over by D'Agostino's. So you're crossing three roads, entrances of the rotary which isn't fun to cross as a pedestrian that's able-bodied. And then you have to get your way back, you know, either go through town or go down through the common lot and then cross Waterfield Road. So what I'm <coughs> asking is, to, is there some way to be an interconnection in there with the MBA, MBTA? I don't know if the MBTA has extra money in terms of improving <laughs> size. <laughs> no, 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 I know that, they, but no. what I'm saying at the bottom of that ramp on Shore Road, they have to modify the side with the ramp. Is, will they work on, you know, the crosswalk there, at least in that section. Is there a way to deal with that a little bit better? Because your interconnectivity stinks in this town to get from one end to another. And that rotary is probably one of the most dangerous intersections in all honesty. And the, the sidewalks are extremely narrow. I, I don't know the, the corner of Shore and Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon where the old sandwich shop was. I think it's a realtor now. I can sometimes not walk past somebody in that sidewalk. It's very lovely, but some of the people put uh, planters out in front of their doors. Yeah. It narrows the sidewalk. Okay, so enough of that. Very quickly at the end, goal 11, the complete do streets. Not. Just so you know, TTAC does not include it. I just checked it. And it should. Time. In yeah. my mind, I mean, how can you have a traffic advisory committee yeah, without? So that's just my opinion, but I think it should. Uh, goal 15, hazard preparedness. You include things like nine English speakers. You have to include, you know, there's a whole handicap contingency. There's, there's elderly contingency. There's medical issues that aren't technically, you know, under the handicapped. So I would appreciate if there was more language in there about that. 
um, that could be under the health department or whatever. Uh, goal number 17, you talk about community groups getting them involved in government like ENCA. Can you include like the special ed parent advisory commission? You know, some more wording that includes the disabled community would be nice in my mind. Number 18, same thing. You're talking about inclusivity. Uh, disability group would be great there too. And number, uh, just throwing out this was just a little add-on for 19 Parkers consider it for the preschool program as far as I know there still has not been a definitive master plan it may have changed with the Lynch school construction mm -hmm. but when I was in the eighth PBC ages ago there still was never that definitive master plan for what to do with the preschool and you save money if you keep it all together there's different pluses and minuses my understanding is it's coming in through Lynch as of right now right. We're, but that doesn't mean the state may push us so we're kind of but right now that is the preference is right. to have it come in through Lynch yeah um, just a throwing out there that was a little add-on I, I said I wasn't going to comment but just so you know um, your goal one three eight ten fifteen seventeen eighteen I have in my notes for them already right. so um, what for all, everyone who's listening what happened is we got feedback from and I hope you come and speak and help us um, provide feedback Catherine Boyle so Boyle right yeah. okay um, gave feedback and we got some feedback that the language that is currently in the goals did not include um, disabilities mm -hmm. and universal design and different components the intention was always to include those components the intention was there the language that was not there to express the depth of how far we were going with it so yesterday I had a conversation with the consultants yesterday right and mm -hmm. Brian saying we got to fix this because the intention was always there but the language wasn't mm -hmm. there and we need to make sure it's very strong because that is what the goals are of the community is that part of the inclusive components that the, a lot of the residents talked about talked about disability and different uh, different abilities and inclusivity of all oh, I mean, the, the, the array is very wide in it um, you know and they're so so anyway so they are aware they know they were going to go through with a fine tooth comb I went through it, mm -hmm. it today for a couple hours and started making it and this actually is very this actually is more helpful than what I did because mine is well. <laughs> So, um, but um, this is very helpful. And I, is there anything that she mentioned that you are in disagreement with? No. <laughs> I, I, I'm not in disagreement with any of it. Dieb, are you in any way? I want to add. So I thank you so much. The stroller has the same. Well, it, well even, the thing about the, no, the, let's not, the sorry, wonderful, okay. wonderful thing. We're way behind no, no, no. But I'm just saying the wonderful thing about adaptive design. That I agree. It benefits everybody. <laughs> yeah. It benefits everybody. Okay. Anytime you hurt your ankle and you're using crutches, you know, it benefits everybody. We, we agree. Sorry. Thank no, you. No. So anyway, thank you so much. And, and can you can you incorporate all of it? Thank you. Yeah. All right. Did anyone else have any comments? And thank you so much for taking the time to write those down too. It is very helpful. Um, Pamela Court, Precinct 5, and I'm on the Master Plan Steering Committee. I um, have to thank you all for the hard work that you've done in the review and the community for its input. Um, and I apologize for not going through this with these kinds of things in mind earlier and springing them on. The group more at the last minute some of my comments um, will probably um, be redundant with some of the things that Deborah said and some of the things that Deborah added are in areas that I missed when I was going through with these things in mind and so I, I thank her and then I I added I read the letter that Catherine Boyle sent to you mm -hmm. she is um, an asset to our community and she um, along with a, a, another wonderful uh, mother runs Autism Housing Pathways, which is a terrific resource within our state, um, and I thank her for that. So um, I used some of her wording, and I want to um, just say, Catherine, if there's something in there that you think is not appropriate or that you'd like to modify, feel free. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Um, I'm just trying to capture what you wrote and make sure that, it, that it's in here. So um, along with what Deborah said in, go in goal A1.1, one and I'll, I'll type these up and provide them to you um, to add universal design and ADA compliance to the list of areas of expertise of a, a, a planner that that we hope to get um, in goal three um, I 
thought it would be good to add some overall wording that includes the, addi the additional um, criteria that it includes options for people with disabilities, including physical, intellectual, and developmental, um, and in, in parentheses, such as autism. For goal A3.2, um, or I'm not sure whether it would be more appropriate in goal A4.1, um, but in the first paragraph of A3.2, to add accessory dwelling units in the first paragraph and this sentence, units which are, and this is, um, I thank you, Catherine, for this wording, units which are affordable to those at or below 50% of the area median income to serve the needs of intellectually or developmentally disabled residents who live solely on supplemental security income must not be neglected. Um, in goal A 4.2, to add um, group homes to the second to last sentence. Um, and in the first sentence, I apologize because that uh, precedes that, um, to add adults with developmental or intellectual disabilities. In goals 9 and 10, in the matrix for um, supporting entities, to add the Disability Access Commission as a supporting entity. Um, and whichever, I'm, I don't want to specify the sub goals, I can leave that to the consultant to determine where that's appropriate um, or the, the planning board. Um, for goal 16, to add um, and within town government. So um, for people in the audience who are... Um, this is hard to process. Yeah, I apologize because now that's getting off the disability a little bit and more with the community um, engagement. Um, but it, 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 it talks about um, the staff, the um, paid staff within the building, and I thought it would be good to include within town government as well. So improving communication and um, intra-committee communication, if that, does that make sense? Um, for goal D16.1 in the second paragraph, to include among the organizations that were listed, Parent to Parent, the Coalition for a Safe Community, and the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Also known as WINPAC. Also known as WINPAC, and in other towns it's known as a CPAC, S-E-P-A-C. It's uh, abbreviated differently in our, in our community. For Goal D17.2, to include elected and appointed officials and to add ethics training as well. Um, for goal 18.1, it's sort of a conditional comment. Um, if the facilities master plan does not include the DAC audit of town facilities to add a reference to that document. So I'm going to have you pause there. We have a, I'm going to pause her because she's talking about something that none of you know about. So there's a plan that the DAC did that we never, the planning board was never CC'd on it. We are going to forward that to you because it is the one and probably the last plan. So Brian worked today to try to get access to it and we'll get it to you just so you know what she's referring to. It, it's an to. audit, by the way. It's not necessarily a plan. It's a, yeah, it's an audit of our. No, that's can, so good. Can we get a copy too? Everyone's gonna get one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for goal D20.1 in the third paragraph, um, to add support for new parents, single parents, and families of young children with special needs. And in the fourth paragraph, to include adjustment counselors and special education staff to the list of school staff that you have in that paragraph already. And in goal D20.3, um, to include elected and appointed town officials um, in addition to the other 
people that are mentioned in there bec um, because their interaction with the public puts them in a, a unique position that often requires sensitivity that, that isn't always a natural um, quality in, in some of the, the wonderful folks that volunteer in our town. And I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you. And you are going to send a written copy, please? I am. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I started taking notes and then I just. I know, I know. <laughs> I am going to, I'm going to, I'll type that up. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Did you have any questions, Anne, on any of those? Are you pretty much. We're going to wait for the transcript. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I took notes, but. Okay. I would love to also have. If you have any questions, you can ask. <laughs> You can ask Brian or I as well. Yeah. I, I pretty much followed everything she was saying, but I just read this like with intent. Please come join us. I'm Kathy Boyle, I live on Willowdale Road, and I sit on the Housing Partnership Board and on the Housing Authority. Um, and um, I did not take the kind of detailed deep dive that Pam did. Um, but I want to make a couple of points. Um, two things, Pam, I'd like to modify what you said, where you said SSI. I'd like to add SSI and or SSDI, because you don't want SSI to become a limiting factor, especially since people who are on SSI move on to SSDI when a parent dies, retires, or becomes disabled. Um, and in terms of group home, because group home has a legal definition, um, rather than group home, I would prefer to say congregate housing for adults with developmental disabilities, um, because that's a broader. Okay. That's what it is. That's what it is. You know, um, because most people who need it don't actually qualify for a group home, but they will qualify for the other. Um, Beyond that, I mostly want to draw your attention to the fact that um, disability, we, we've got to be careful not to just look at disability in the narrow physical sense, um, that there is a broad array of disability uh, from, you know, people who become disabled, people who are born disabled, physical, intellectual, mental, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that the ADA does not just address physical accessibility, the ADA addresses programmatic accessibility, which is all too often lost yeah. in the process. And we need to be aware of that programmatic aspect to ADA. Um, and one thing I'm going to raise that you know may seem like throwing a Molotov cocktail here, but I'm going to raise the question when we talk about housing, if we want to start to talk about visitability, um, which is basically the concept that when we look at new structures, we're not talking about retrofitting, but when we're looking at new structures, we want the first floor to be visitable by someone using a wheelchair. Um, and you know that allows both for visitability, because you've got your friend who comes over for dinner. It also makes it much easier if you wind up having to do a conversion at some point because somebody is acquiring a disability. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Did anyone else have any comments? All right, Planning Board, let's dive in. So I'm assuming everyone reviewed it and you read the comments that came in from various members of the community. Um, I, um, I, I just wanted um, to talk about some of those comments that came in and um, if we want them added in or want them addressed, um, then we add it in and also I wanted to see from the board how you feel about where the master plan is and get feedback on it. So if we're in the right direction. Hmm? We're missing two people. I mean, yeah. yeah, well, she'll give her feedback too as well. Why don't you start? Um, well, hang on. So why don't we work toward a time? Because we could go forever. It's a very long document. Uh, so I'm interested right now in just how we're going to do this. Um, we survive and get some sleep tonight. <laughs> I don't With all due respect. That. No. And that's so I would throw out. 
I just decided this process has been done by a very large group over a very long time. So there are certain things you were mentioning, such as who is actually taking charge, the implementation piece. Yep. And I think that that should be done with all of us really assigned to think about it, because I just accepted it and thought, okay. So if we actually want to go into that part of this discussion, we could do our homework and come in prepared and I think maybe even mark it up. So I think that would help us rather than. Um, well, I wasn't going to go into that. So there's components. What Maureen is referencing, Diab, is the entities, the primary entity responsible and the supporting entities. Yeah, there's right. errors in there. I um, submitted a whole bunch of comments on yeah, that. Yeah, and I, as did I. And so I was I'm, thinking that at this turn, we'll turn in our comments and our, our recommendations on how to adjust those of who's responsible. And then in the next round, those are rather minor. And we'll, de we'll designate um, town meeting members <laughs> to figure, because, yeah, right, and, I would, and uh, update that, make sure that those are accurate. That's I, I th in my opinion, the most important thing to be done tonight is to look at these, these comments that were made yep, that and we should discuss. Um, wait until we get the next iteration of the document, because I made lots of comments on principal parties or responsible parties, and uh -huh. so rather than... I just want to see what it all looks like. So, Anna, when are we potentially getting the last version before March 10th? So that's March I 10th is the last. Ma March 10th is is the our last master plan meeting. I yeah. Believe. So the draft, the next draft of the that will be the sort of next iteration is March 6th. So it'll be the Friday before the okay. Tuesday meeting, right, right. and then. Um, before the planning board meeting on the 24th, there'll be the sort of final version um, for the on the 20th. So we'll send it again the Friday before. Okay. For the sixth, the thing that we'll be asking the steering committee and as well as you guys, because you guys are on the steering committee, to look at will be more of like the sort of the finer details and less of. I mean, also is looking at substance, but this will be that the sort of next phase to look at typos, like the sort of. Catching all the things that we have, we've asked you since you know until now to kind of turn a blind eye to, because we know that a lot of substantive changes are, you know, being made between when you saw the document in December and when you're going to see it when it when you guys adopt it, adopt it, you know, at the end of the month. So that's kind of the next the next phase, I guess. So March. Long story short, March six is the next is when we're getting the draft that we will For then. The yeah, which we yeah. will then go with a fine tooth comb between the master plan steering committee and us. We'll go through it with a fine tooth comb, looking for those errors of who's responsible um, in more depth than what we marked up. So my thought was just to go through the comments. Um, we addressed the majority of them here. I don't think there's anything that I personally, I am in agreement with pretty much everything said. So going to the ones that we received, uh, the main comments received, um, though we received one today regarding ethics training. I am in full support of that um, and open meeting law training included. I think it came in on uh, Pamela's comments as well. So that will be coming in as well. But I also noted it in my markup to Anna. So you'll see it coming in. I mean, I think that's a good thing. We, we talk about that a lot um, uh, in general uh, around town. And we kind of have fallen, town has fallen off on that. So I agreed with that. And um, do you want to go down the list of topics since you have your email up? Um, yeah, there were, so one was related, like you said, to, um, specifically to ethics training. Uh, we obviously are required to do ethics training every two years by the state. Um, it's through, uh, certificate. yeah, it's through this, uh, an online training and the, the comment was related towards having not, uh, the bare minimum, but why not, uh, we really should be doing annual training that's, uh, either with legal counsel or with the town clerk. Uh, real face-to-face -face training related related to ethics. Um, Can I ask, us as all government have a volunteers. Questions. So I want to get more specific. So this is um, from Kevin Sarney. He sits on the zoning board, and he wrote a, a letter to Brian, and we were all copied. So mm -hmm. this is public record. Um, and he also said, I would like to see all town committees, including the planning board, take a signed oath not to work with any outside consultants 
or with applicants that use consultants that have, been, have known ethics violations. And then he adds a signed form should be required from all applicants that they have, um, that, they, that come before the town. So we have an applicant right now who has working, is working with a, um, an applicant working with a consultant, and I think we have to say it's um, the design team that was just here and the developers and their um, consultant on, um, the, uh, I guess, what, hydraulic, um, hydrology, uh, if that's hydraulic engineering, mm -hmm. um, is Larry Beals and his company. And so he's the person who's being referred to here. And we have the question of whether we, and whether this is an aspect of ethics training and whether we have some role in, um, and whether we can do this as well. He'd like to see us um, take a signed oath, not to, and for other people, um, or with applicants that use consultants that have known ethics violations. So I'd like, I think we owe a response to this question, which I, came at, under the master plan. I think we owe a response, but I would really love to get legal's opinion on this. I don't plan on waiting into that nest of crocodiles or alligators on my own. Oh, no, I wouldn't have yeah, expect yeah. that, nor would I. But I also well, want to make it clear it was not something this board did um, at all. But we do have a proponent right now with um, in this where we're in this situation. So my thoughts with that is I've, I've been very open about it as a volunteer that I work in the greater Boston region. I do not take clients out of Winchester. Mm -hmm. um, and I gave that up to sit on this board. However, with the limited and Amount, how many volunteers it takes to run this town. If we do that, it's going to hinder the volunteer. It was I, I was able to do it. I could do it within my structure of my business and how my family needs me to operate. To, mm -hmm. But I don't think that is the case. And so with that, I just did not go into that direction. Mm -hmm. But I do think ethics training um, is and having everyone come together and also better communication between boards um, would be help that tremendously and deal with those. And um, I, what he's referencing there is, um, and what happened is not okay. And um, on a regular basis, there should be the training. And um, I think the master plan calling it is, is significant. I think that. it's going to require some, um, maybe council being present, but I also think I'm, I just want to bring up the idea of, since this, I mean, there was a lot of email, and again, it would all be public record if anybody's interested, but um, so it should be known. Um, and for myself, I think one of the bigger concerns is that the, and I don't have any, no, I have not even any no impression. I can say with confidence this has not been an issue with the current board. But um, there is this way that people exchange, who are in certain professions, especially in the building world, um, they exchange recommendations so basically they throw work to other people so there's no exchange of cash but there's this idea of go hire so-and-so or oh I think so-and-so would be good and so-and-so knows that and so at Winchester where we got these professionals and often working in Boston um, there is a real um, concern I have about how this um, how this little world works I'm not in it you're not in it you're not in it but it I, well I am in it actually but I, I am in the building industry, and they it's a small world, especially in residential, we're majority residential, but um, we're in it, and, and everyone knows everyone. So why don't we, why don't okay. we direct Brian, not direct Brian, ask Brian, I was gonna direct our attention, but anyway, wrong word. <laughs> Brian, can you set up a meeting with legal so we can talk about these issues and find out what's, what's possible and also what's practical, because we have to balance practicality, knowing that we have a limited pool of applicants. You want people, so it's a, it's a tough line to navigate. So ha knowing what other towns have done, knowing what's available, it would be really useful. I would say also, and I guess this is supposed to be going into a master plan, but it ha should be, it's a master plan work, I mean, it's the planning board's work with the master plan to say we feel that ethics um, uh, training, I would say it goes beyond the narrowest training I got, which was has been twice now, um, is the state, it's the state 
online training. Online, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, I do think that it goes beyond that because the uh, more subtle concern that happens in this town is this business of just giving recommendations for other, um, other parties, whether they're involved in engineering, architecture, or construction, and it's happening a lot. So I'm actually pleased to hear this raised, but it does mean we've got other boards um, and it's going, it can be an issue with some of the other uh, people sitting on other boards. So it's not something that we, and I want to make that really clear, especially with the cameras, this is not just our board. Um, we've got other boards where we have people in these, um, I'll, again, I'll just say this, who are just in the world uh, where they're, they, because of what they do. Um, or not, maybe even though what they do, they're still recommending so-and-so and, -so and um, just kind of, so it's, it's unsavory. So do we have enough, do you have enough direction to put something in? I, because I. Yeah, so to recap what I heard you all say, and so this, this is, I'm glad that I'm here so I can verify right. what I'm actually yeah, hearing. Yeah, that's what I'm glad So what too. I'm hearing is to add in language around an ethics training, but not necessarily getting into the piece that you were raising, Maureen, around the ethics violations, working with consultants, until you all talk with legal about that. Well, I mean, it doesn't seem like that's a master plan thing. That seems that's like an operational, okay. yeah. is my, that's my mind. You raised it, I mean, the sure. justice, there are all these other, like, um, accessibility that we should be also well, thinking about. That so I mean, I, I think it goes under the good governance section, or however we're calling it, yeah. sustainable governance, and I think it, it can be specific stated broadly right maybe it's something like ethics val like val yeah. something around values and, and then the strategy would be i didn't do it i put it in as increase i don't know come up with the right words for the strategy the online, that's what was yeah yeah oh no it's more it's yeah. what he's talking about is where all the boards and committees come together for training pretty much is what he's what asking for. Yeah. and then things like that are brought up like are you allowed as a town government right elected official because of elected is different than appointed as well are you allowed to I'm not an ethics uh training. well not from the town's I mean, not from the is state's different. perspective well, I would, town I, meeting is it's true i would just say that I mean, yeah, there's, there's different right. rules between elected and appointed yeah. we need to just looking at time i think we can yeah i'm running out of words on this one <laughs> um, so it's a complex issue I think we have enough for one for the right. this next round of revisions, right. and if you between yeah. now and like two weeks, for, you know, from now in the next round when you're read through it again, you yeah. can have you yeah. know, fine tune that piece. I think yeah. that makes sense. Was there was there something else other than that? Um, the only other thing that came in um, uh, near the end of last week uh, was a member of FinCom uh, with some initial. Um, that uh, some initial comments that got um, forwarded to Jennifer Goldson. It was to focus on kind of some top, whether it's five or more, you know, five top five-ish goals and those activities they expect to happen in the next two fiscal years. So they're they're looking more towards uh, organization of a timeline with very specific um, um, types of projects. So identify recurring versus one-time expenses identify capital versus operating expenses, and identify those strategies that will result in additional costs. For example, they said developing a plan for something will probably result in actions that may cost more money. Um, so just kind of organizing those buckets. Um, so that, that was kind of the main Yeah, point. it would be incredibly helpful. I mean, I know you're going to take this and put it into the back in the format that you yeah. have. This is just how we're reviewing it before you go into that format. But it would be very helpful if you had a, um, a log without yes. all the language and everything. So it's D17.1, and it's just the you know, update zoning bylaw and regulations with modernized and inclusive language, right? And then yeah. it's just listed, and then the timeline is next to it. And then maybe they are sorted um, yeah, by their I can actual talk to timeline. That a little bit. And, but it's also, you know, this is the list of the goals all in one place versus yeah. 30 pages spread yes. out. One thing that we've talked about internally is sort of having uh, in the action plan kind of at the at the end, sorting it based, like based, it's kind of what you're talking about, like different by like are these ongoing, like by timeline, by also the strategy type. So that way, you know, for some people, they're going to want to read through the whole thing. But also I imagine that 
the planning board, you all will want to be like, okay, well, what are the things that we or actually ours. are going to, yeah. Or, yeah. or like, what are all the policy it. things? I want to look through those really quick. So that's kind of one thing that we're talking about doing, you know, as like sort of a cross-reference, I guess is the right way to talk about Excel it. Excel spreadsheet could do it quickly too. Yeah. <laughs> but for the printout. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, go ahead. One more. Um, so somebody raised this recently, and I feel as if I should say, um, yeah, Culpa, I don't remember how um, uh, hiring a zoning enforcement officer, did that make it in? Anybody? The zoning Call enforcement building? officer? No, yeah. it did not make it in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's been a long-term priority for the town, and it's been something we've advocated for a long time. So better now than not at all. It's a... Uh, I, you know, one of the, I guess I'd say this, as much as we've had this uh, great working group, one of the things that we bring into the whole process is knowing just exactly how the whole permitting process works and what, how, what's the intake, what's the, how, what's the step of the flow chart and so on, and I missed it. So it sounds like I'm not alone, but that is absolutely one of the things we've talked about. Even last year at um, the Finance Committee meeting, we were talking about it. So I think well, we, it kind uh, of got because, if I remember correctly, the ZBA doesn't want it. Is that correct? Well, that's not that. Well, the building department really is the one with the, the ZBA. I think that's yeah, it a, wouldn't be through ZBA. Right. Yeah. yeah I think, I think that's a town manager related issue. I know we've had discussions yeah. around that. Well, we have all sorts of things in there. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just the historically, we, we did talk about it in the budget and we went around on that and it didn't. Right. Didn't percolate up. Did it percolate up to the top? It's I can't our fault. remember. And I would say there's some other people, and I know where this came from, but I guess I'm not feeling that I was authorized to say. But it, um, it's it's something that we overlooked. Right. So the, I don't know if we overlooked it or I reallocated I our. I I'm, focused I'm on reallocating. Yeah, but just, in the master plan, there are all sorts of positions that I never even thought about. So it's. Um, I think. Right now, the master plan has uh, positions that we, I mean, this is old news for this board. I hope we're um, no. going to be doing an about face. I think, yes, there's a rationale for why zoning enforcement is not the same as um, uh, the, the building code. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and then the follow through and the communication and coordination between all the projects and the conditions placed on those projects through mm -hmm. zoning. Right, yeah. exactly. The, my only concern at this date is how we prioritize that relative to the other positions. Because we did it actually- That was put in by the consultants, not by us, and so we can check, question that. But oh I no, I just, we, we, we did have a discussion of prioritizing those positions a few weeks ago. Yeah, with the and Master Plan Steering Committee, it was not on there. Well, it's not too late. And no, I we just, are the, that's we're something the ones we, who vote and adopt it, and we've been saying it for a long time, and I feel as I, if we left the... Right, I just that we need to say something about which position, if, we, if we're given, which position would we want first or second or third? Well, there are several. Do you have that, that list oh, where yeah. it ended up? I'm not ready to do that because there are all sorts of positions. I'm just going to give her a tentative place to put it for right now. And right, then exactly. We, exactly. After I can pull, you mean the list, uh, how, what uh, the different positions are? Yeah. Yeah, I can pull it out of my head in that it's a planner position, uh, sustainability director, a grants writer, uh, communications and outreach coordinator, and... There are a lot of positions. There was an engineering and additional engineering uh, person and engineering department. It was the, that was the sustainability The sustainability department. director, oh, yeah. And then we changed the economic development person to a task force. So there's no new hire. It's just going to be a sort of new committee, I guess, mm -hmm. is basically what it is. I will say this, the zoning enforcement officer, we've always felt, and I do still, that it would be a part-time position. So for anybody right. to care about that. But I don't think we have to solve that right now. No, I really but I would probably put it, again. I would probably put it in more of the three to three year round versus a zero to three round. Right. I don't care. Uh, that's what I, she needed to know yeah. more is, and, and that is really to, the goal is to, we have we're increasing on the site plan and all the site review and conditions are and they need to be followed through and communication needs to go through between all the boards um, well and the reality is a lot of the um, zoning questions go to Brian yeah. and it's really not where they're supposed to land yep. but, I mean it's okay in terms of if it's a special permit then that's really where the town planner comes into play but that's not what's happening right now it's more like what does this mean yeah and, um, there should be a zoning enforcement officer. Um, 
So in terms of where in the plan you think that should go? Yeah, that balance thing. Probably. Yeah, in the part the the balancing thing. <laughs> okay. The balancing maybe act. right. Maybe it's like right under. Maybe it's in the yeah. same yeah. one under the yeah, planner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We look at it when you right. You're authorized. <laughs> it just should be there. Um, any other comments that were John had comments? Um, um, yeah, those went directly to the consultant. Yeah. Um, oh. That said, do all comments that come in just go in? Because certainly ours didn't. No, they shouldn't. The, that's part of why uh, you why you guys are talking yeah. about it tonight. Can you? Well, John's here, but um, can you summarize it? I think yeah, John would probably be able to summarize his comments. John, do you want to? Are we doing it right now, or is and again? Well, we are looking through all the comments we got, right. so. Yep. Yeah, there's that, and then. Um, Do you have comments from someone who hasn't been involved in this process right. for the there's last 5,000 years? Exactly. That's how I would phrase it. Um, no. Oh, yeah. Kevin hasn't been involved. I mean, there there are some. Yeah, yeah. Those are the ones I would highlight. Those are the ones evening. we talked about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. in the past um, two and a half weeks, there um we, we have talked about all those comments and those are so far have been related to um, the finance committee which as we talked about very briefly we're going to be actually be getting more comments from the finance committee because they met um, on Monday and reviewed it um, another the, um, another round so the idea is that they're gonna have um, I basically told told them you know kind of as soon as possible um, but so there we're gonna probably be getting a few more comments from fincom that would um, getting that put, would potentially get incorporated um, uh, by March 6th if, if, if that's in time. The other ones were related to the DAC, the Disability Access Commission. Um, and then the one that came in like yesterday or um, uh, related to ethics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and then there was one comment regarding uh, child care. Um, but that had to deal with more not an understanding that the whole town anywhere even in anywhere can have um, child care it's it's a completely open everywhere throughout town um, it really comes down to um, the cost of the land to put your child care facility there um, and there's very little we can do for that but it's zoned right now to allow child care anywhere in town um, and um, there was a discussion which it doesn't really fit into the master plan kind of does though about retaining teachers there's discussion about putting a child care facility at Lynch when it's built because it will pay for itself but then also retain teachers because they can put their kids into that child care facility um, and that is like a benefit to them but it's they have they pay for the child care but it's at yeah. inside town and it helps retain them and so it's kind of a thought that maybe that is uh, feasible since it will pay for itself and that is that goes towards more re teacher retention um, uh, so that's kind of that one didn't really have a good fit for the master plan. Can we can we get that forwarded to the school committee and whoever is dealing with planning at lunch? No, that came from a member of the school committee. Oh, okay. Good. She's considering. They're considering it. So, so. it's under consideration as a option. So um, I. But um, so that is uh, that is that. Um, I have a tremendous amount of comments. I'm gonna have Brian copy because we're going to go into executive. I'll have them copy it and give it to you, and I'll keep one copy and you can have the other, but mm. have fun. <laughs> so there's a lot of notes and thoughts on my part, um, and I think we're good. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Did you want to say anything or just listening? Or Oh, thank you for coming, everyone, and thank you for, for your patience for because we're running behind schedule, and I really and appreciate I'm it. I'm waiting at 10 no matter what, and you should too. <laughs> um, okay. I'll make um, here. Yes, please. All right. Thank you, Anna, for coming in, and thank you for all, and all your comments. You're going to type yours up, and you grab Kathy's, correct? Her, okay. Um, wait, was that Kathy's or was that? No, no, no this was um, Deborah's. Yeah. So Kathy's, Kathy's was in an email. Kathy's